In films, there is such a thing as the movie god. And the movie god will bring you different people. The two leads in The Exorcist had never been in a film before. Jason Miller and Linda Blair. I had no idea who was going to play those parts. So much of what you do is just inspiration. And then there's luck. With the French Connection being recognized as one of the most sort of influential urban crime films of the 70s, I was wondering why in 85 then you chose to sort of revisit that, that genre or that sort of framing for a story. If there were things within that first film that you were seeking to do better or undo or uh, play against audience expectations. I wanted to do another chase scene after the French Connection and see if I could top it. Um, <laughs> thank you. But basically, I met this guy who was in the Secret Service for 20 years. And he was kind of a pex bad boy, like the lead guy in this picture. And he wrote a novel about his experiences as a Secret Service guy. It's called To Live and Die in L.A. I, I met him and read his novel, and I thought, that this is really cinematic, and it's great because the Secret Service is part of the U.S. Treasury. So the Secret Service not only protects the president and other dignitaries, but they're also in charge of counterfeiting. And I became very interested in the art of counterfeiting. And the guy who wrote the novel, who was a Secret Service agent, he got a, a counterfeiter out of jail that he had busted. And this guy came out and he showed us how to make all this money. And the money was fantastic. I may still have some of it in my wallet because I took a lot of the 20s that we made and I put them in with bills that I had and I passed a lot of this money. And it, it was never questioned. I would go up to a, to a bar and buy drinks for three or four people who were sitting there with a counterfeit 20. One day I got a call from the California Attorney General, and it turns out that the son of the prop man had seen some of these bills on his father's dresser. And he took some of the bills, he and his friends, and they were pretty young, and he passed them at a supermarket. And there was only one problem. A lot of these bills were only printed on one side, and some were printed on the other side only. Within a few minutes, the manager of the store had the Secret Service come down, and they grabbed these two kids. Where did you get this money? Well, it was my dad's. And they knocked on the prop man's door at about 3 in the morning, and they tossed him, and he gave them my name. And the next morning, I got the call from the uh, state attorney general, Robert Bonner. And he said, to Mr. Friedkin, um, I'd love to have you come in and talk to us about this counterfeit money. And I said, look, Mr. Bonner, you know that you need a warrant to have me come in. If you get a warrant, I will honor it, and I'll come in and talk to you. But otherwise, this was made for a movie. And he said, Mr. Friedkin, I don't give a damn if it was made for a movie. It's illegal to make money unless you're the U.S. government. Talked a number of times about how all of your films are about that thin line between yeah. good and evil. There's, it's a very thin line between the policeman and the criminal. The best cops, if they weren't cops, would probably be bad guys. 
and sometimes they are both. I wanted to talk to you about the parts of Los Angeles and sort of Los Angeles adjacent that the film is shot in. What version of LA did you want to capture and present in the film? Well, I didn't want to show anything that was like a familiar landmark. There are not really many familiar landmarks in Los Angeles. And the skyline then was a lot less inspiring than it is now. But I didn't want to show downtown LA. I, uh, I, I didn't want to show anything that would be readily identifiable to the audience. When I came out to Los Angeles from Chicago in 1965, I went all over the city. And I went to places like Wilmington and San Pedro, and there's a Fijian neighborhood. And all of these areas were extraordinarily interesting and different. And I, so I set most of the film near the LA Harbor. As with New York and the French Connection, I created my own Los Angeles. And it was based on areas that are still pretty much undiscovered and unknown, except to the people who, who live there. And were you getting permits for all the areas, or were you just running and gunning? I don't ever get permits. Permits, permits are silly. I shoot with a very small crew, and we just go there and shoot, and by the time anyone comes along to figure out what the hell we're doing, we're done. I try to shoot very quickly. I don't like to do more than one take unless a camera falls over or a light falls in the shot or... Now, for the freeway, we had to get permission. <laughs> and we had permission to shoot the freeway only on weekends and from like 7 a.m. until maybe 3 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. But I had this cinematographer named Robbie Mueller and Robbie was uncomfortable shooting coverage because he loved the light when the light was in a certain place. When the sun was coming from a certain place, or even if it was a gray day and it was all reflected light, he was not comfortable about changing a lot of angles. Because I loved his work and wanted him to do this picture, I adapted to that and didn't shoot a lot of coverage. And I took that into the future work that I did. You mentioned shooting this film in s such a short time. How did rehearsals fit into that? I know oh, that I don't a lot rehearse. Of, no rehearsals. No, no. Uh, rehearsals are for sissies. <laughs> if I was doing Shakespeare or Harold Pinter, I rehearsed the hell out of that because Pinter and Shakespeare are writing a kind of blank verse, and you can't improvise it. But the films I've done are all basically street talk. And so once I've given the actors the script, I will then let them put it in their own words. If I've cast the picture well, that works. If I've cast it poorly, I'm dead. So at what point in the creative process did you start thinking about the soundtrack? The soundtrack is completely separate from the picture. I've done all of my soundtracks completely after I shot the film. And on this film, the score was done by a group called Wang Chung that was very big in the 80s. And I got in touch with them and asked them if they would write a score for a film that I hadn't even written yet. But I, I felt I was on the same page with their music. And before that, about eight years before that, was a group called the Tangerine Dream, one of the first bands doing synthesizer music. And I heard them at, a, at an abandoned church in the Black Forest in Germany from midnight to 3 a.m. And they didn't play songs, they just played, they made ethereal sounds for three hours. And I went to the leader of the group and I told him 
the film I was planning, and I said, when I get the script, I'll send you the script. And then I want you to write a score without having seen the film. Same thing with this. They wrote the score without ever having seen the film. But I told them, don't write a theme song called To Live and Die in L.A. I do not want a song called To Live and Die in L.A. So they wrote all, this, all these tracks, and they were great. I thought they were wonderful. And then I brought them to L.A. to see how I used their music. And the next morning, they came in and handed me a song called To Live and Die in L.A. And I said, fellas, I told you I don't want this. And they said, will you just listen to it? So I listened to it, and I thought it was great. After I'd finished cutting the movie, I shot the first scene in the picture to be able to use that music that I didn't want. And I was wondering, I guess, how situating you and this film within sort of new Hollywood in the 1970s, did that work against you, being associated with that? No, the 70s are still considered a great period in American film. I mean, you had films like The Godfather and Chinatown and Taxi Driver and so many classic films in the 70s. You guys ever go to the movies? <laughs> movies are dead now. For a good movie to come out today, it's like a wildflower that grows out of the concrete. They are that rare. Almost everything is superheroes, really mindless stuff. The great cinema is, is I'm sorry to say, really behind us.